I actually, before the tournament kicked off, I was like, I'd love to see an Ireland versus South Africa final or, you know, Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, somewhere along there. But as the tournament went on and we've seen how much of an impact, negative impact it had on the tournament when Ireland and France both went out on the same weekend, that anybody that you talk to now is just like, ah, oh, well, sure, I just... It does. It's not the same without the French. It's not the same without the Irish. And I know we've got an unbelievable final, but I think it would be ten times bigger. I know a lot of box and a lot of Kiwis will disagree, but I think it would be ten times bigger if it had been a France versus Ireland final. Um, I really do, and more so because of the the brand of rugby that both both teams play, and the team that. South Africa have picked and almost feels like everything that they've done over the last four years. They evolved their game. They've sort of went back to what won them the 2019 Rugby World Cup, probably more so what won them that semi final against Wales in 2019. So, yeah, it's 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 a team selection by South Africa that I probably expected to be honest. Um, no doubt we'll hear Matt Williams. You know, criticizing world rugby that this shouldn't be allowed and like it's making a mockery of the game and everything else. But again, I think it's compelling. I think it's it's getting more and more people talking about the rugby world cup, talking about the South African side. Um, and I think after last weekend, with all the changes that was made that were made dur- during the eighty minutes, like just felt like every five minutes he was taking off one of his best players. Like, you know, Okalise come off. That's a Beth, you're up to world player of the year. We'll take you off. Okay. You, you know, it was, uh, it was bizarre, but there's obviously thought behind all this madness. And of course, we're still waiting on the New Zealand team to be announced, but you would think it would be very much unchanged. And they probably won't go into that 7-1 or probably not even a 6-2 split to, Try and uh, compensate for for maybe the power game of uh, of South Africa, but it's an intriguing battle. It's gonna be a magnificent final. It sh- it has to be edge of the seat stuff. The way this World Cup has gone, it feels Donny like like even in that England game, it felt like there was gonna be a twist. It just felt like he didn't it, and I was like. Oh geez, I'm gonna go on the bookies here and have a look to see how much South Africa are to win this game. They are currently ten points down with fifteen minutes to go. And you know, crept on, I had a look and was like, mm-hmm. and of course there was a huge twist. There was a huge, huge twist. Um the French game, huge twist against South Africa. Um a couple of other, of course, Fiji, Australia games. Uh it just feels like it's, there's going to be something that's going to happen in this match. It's going to keep us all very much involved. So, uh, yeah, for for me, I, I just think that the biggest, strongest, fittest, hardest team usually come out on top. And at the minute, I, I personally feel that South Africa. And, and to be honest, as the tournament has went on, I, all, I, I hope I'm actually proved wrong. I hope I am. I, I, I now want New Zealand to to win the Rugby World Cup because of the style of rugby that they play, because they play a little bit more like Ireland. They're willing to take chances. Of course, they've got an unbelievable defence and they kick the ball an awful lot, but they they just don't rely on on sheer size and power to, to, to get them out a, a win. Uh, they rely on brilliance. They rely on skill. They re- rely on top quality coaching to come up with specific plays to break down defences where just feels like South Africa are a little bit too one-dimensional in everything that they do. So let's hope I'm proved right. World Rugby needed a tournament that was um, going to be pretty clean in terms of huge incidents that resulted in red cars or yellow cars that didn't just dominate the front pages of the newspapers and tabloids and social media. And I think after the first game, was it Argentina against England where Tom Curry get red carded and you know he gets sin binned and many people thought that that was accidental and he, that should never happen but I almost think that that sort of laid down a little bit of a, a marker and, and and set a tone for the rest of the tournament that you know you are going to get yellow carded or red carded um for something like that that happens 
he got red carded and many people disagree but I, I thought that was actually good for the tournament and I actually feel that World Rugby will be delighted with how the tournament has panned out we've hardly seen a yellow or red card uh, since the knockouts um, and hopefully we see that again in, in the final but yeah I go back to my earlier point it just feels like because it was on in France the northern hemisphere sides specifically specifically Ireland and France the support is just off the charts like just absolutely off the charts and um I know anybody that's been to the the game since like the two semi-finals have said ah oh, it's completely dead the atmosphere is flat um it's it's not that good so um yeah I think I can speak on behalf of a, a lot of people a lot of rugby fans that the quarterfinal weekend almost felt like the finals weekend, like, you know, winner takes all sort of occasion. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think there'll be um, a lot of positives taken out of this Rugby World Cup. It's only in the last 24 hours that I've actually changed my mind of on why I want New Zealand to win. And I listened to an interview, interview sorry, earlier on today with John Dobson, was talking about the impact that, you know, a decision to take Manny LeBoc off after 30 minutes, you know, how that, you know, he, he sort of said that it, it can mentally destroy a player. Um, and they progress. I, I personally felt it progressed so much. Like Manny LeBoc started against South Africa or started against New Zealand in Twickenham when they pumped them by 30 odd points. So it just feels like it's a step backwards that he's went with Andre Pollard, who was like, should have cost him the game against France. Like he was so poor in defense. Like he was just missing tackles all over the place. He redeemed himself. Of course, he did in the semi final with a clutch kick, a couple of clutch kicks. But yeah, it, it just feels like the seven one split on the bench is is starting actually to annoy me a little bit. Um, uh, Jasper Visa, Trevor and Kane, guys who haven't played in the last three weeks are coming in fresh, ready and ready to go. Um. They're always mixing up, changing up their squad, but like that's what a squad of 33 is for, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I, I feel sorry for Manny Labak. I feel sorry for um a couple of the other players that I wouldn't say they're scapegoats for for the first half against England, but it, it almost felt like they were just hauled off. And you could see in Manny Labak's body language when he went off the pitch, you know, it was really, really tough on him. But well, like if if I was sitting chatting to Razi Rasmuth or Jax Nienaber, he would say, "Well, Stevie, that decision won us the game, um, yeah. and that's the bottom line. We're a team. We fight for one one another. We make these decisions to benefit everybody else. So they're probably right, and I'm probably wrong. But that's sort of swayed my decision to want New Zealand to to go on and win the the Rugby World Cup, and and also just the style of rugby uh, and and how they've played the likes of Will Jordan lighting it up." Uh, you know, equal in the try scoring record for Rugby World Cup. Uh, and yeah, I, I sincerely hope that they go on and, you know, lay down a marker of, of how the game um, can be played on the big occasion and obviously get a, get a bit of redemption as well for, you know, that demoralising defeat a few weeks ago in Twickenham. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love- Many people might think that Stephen Kitzkoff could, should deserve, you know, the loose head spot. Definitely not. Ox and Che is ridiculous. <laughs> what, what a prop. Like what five foot six, hundred and thirty kegs, powerful, dynamic. Like what a what a what a scrummager. Like so he has to win at loose head. Muvaka, who who obviously got his chance. Um, can't remember who it went was when down injured in the first game, and he come on and absolutely lit it up against New Zealand, and then he kept the starting place and performed really well. Very good in the loose. Um, seems a bit of a, a hard edge about him too. So he has to win a hooker. Antonio French as well. Do you know what? The tight head position didn't really jump out at me. Tag Furlong didn't really reach the peak of his powers. Um, Lomax missed a couple of games for New Zealand. Uh, Malherba for South Africa. He's just really steady, but, you know, apart from scrummage, and he doesn't do a hell of a lot more, but you got to go for Antonio. Um, Antonio Tagburn, second row, incredible. I think he's probably been take out Bundiaki. Uh, you know, I gotta go with Ty Burn as Ireland's best player. Scott Barrett in the second row as well, partner alongside him. How good a second row would that be with Scott Barrett? 
uh, and Tag Byrne be stealing ball for fun. Shannon Frizzell at six, unbelievable line out operator, um, really good in the carry, physical in defense. He's a bit of the glue that sort of holds that back row together for New Zealand. So I've got to go for Zell. Again, no other back rows like massively jumping out at me. Um, I would, with number eight, I could possibly swap Ben Earl, put him at, at six. But um, Lavani Bhatia, the Fijian monster who played in the center about three years ago and was now in the back row uh, at seven. Again, could have swapped Ben Earl in there. But um, yeah. I got to go with uh, La Botia. Um, Artie Savea, number eight, up for World Player of the Year. What a player he is. Anton Dupont, is he the best nine that's ever played the game? Tell you what, like coming back from injury and putting in the performance like he did was just, just unbelievable. So, yeah, I got to go for Anton Dupont. Richie Mwanga, quality player, obviously beat Ireland with that. Ridiculous break, show and go from about 60 metres out. Got it to Will Jordan, and the rest is history. Cheslin Colby on one wing, pace to burn. Showed that obviously against France with a, a breakaway try. Bundy Aki at 12. I think if he had made it to a semi final, he probably would win World Player of the Year. I see him, seen big Jim Hamilton say, Oh, the World Player of the Year has to come from like one of the top two sides. Um, so either South Africa or New Zealand. I would maybe disagree. I think I, I think Bundyaki was that good. He was that good in the in, in during the World Cup and before that as well. Uh, random one. I'm going to go for the Portuguese outside center. That's Pedro Betancourt. Um, again, no outside centers, no thirteens. At Eurico Wani, Gary Ringrose, uh, Jesse Creel. Um, outside of that, not too much more. Um, the Fijian captain, I can't remember, is Nasa Salevu, possibly, mm. but now I've got to go for Pedro Betancourt, Will Jordan. Everybody's going to have him as team 14, and I've got to get an Englishman in there, <laughs> I think, just because of that performance against South Africa. And if there was one player who really Colby dominated Arenza, um, and he's definitely one for the future. So, yeah, Freddie Stewart at number 15. And I could have about 30 other lads on the bench. Uh, but, yeah, that's my Rugby World Cup 2023 starting 15.